ready for true happiness, for deep fulfillment, for feeling alive, on purpose, and in control of your life again, it's time to be the bold, brilliant, beautiful woman you were born to be. Welcome to the Purpose Girl Podcast. I'm women's happiness and life purpose expert, Karen Rockhind, and I'm going to teach you how to live on purpose, feel alive, and be happy in every aspect of life. I'm going to get real about my life and interview women who are living on purpose so that you can finally live yours. Welcome to the show. Hey, Purpose Girl, my love. So a client recently came to me and said, I want to be fearless just like you. And I half started laughing, half started screaming, a little bit started shaking her. Let me clear this up for you the way I cleared it up for her. I am not fearless. I will repeat that again. I am not fearless. Even though I started this podcast and this community of us purpose girls, us women on purpose who are declaring that we are going to claim our happiness and live our best life, even though I went for it and got a spot on a show on Sirius XM radio for several years, even though I started my own business, I left corporate and started my own business, even though I got divorced and now married my great love, please, 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 please do not take that to mean that I am fearless. Quite the opposite. I feel fear almost every single day. The key is that I don't let it stop me. And if I have anything to do with your life, then I will not let it stop you either. So that is what today's episode of the Purpose Girl podcast is all about. All about our fear and how to continue living our dreams, taking steps toward what we want, creating a life of joy and happiness and silly and flirtation and great sex and relationships and a job that you love, like how you do that, even with the fear. You're going to want to stay until the end of the show because I'm going to give you purpose power tips that specifically will help you work with your fear and help you take steps forward no matter what, no matter what your fear says. I don't care if your fear says you're not good enough, you're not capable, you're a fraud, you're too much. I don't care what fear says. So the purpose power tips at the end of the show are going to give you a couple of tips for you to be able to take steps forward, even with that fear right now. So just so that you know you are not alone, I want to tell you all my fears. I sometimes fear that my message won't resonate, that I so, so, so badly desire for you and every woman alive to feel beautiful, to feel whole, to feel joyful, to feel worthy of your dreams. And I sometimes fear that either you or women will roll their eyes at my message or won't quite get it, or somehow it's not going to resonate. I fear that I will fail at some of my biggest dreams. From the time I was in college, I would go to a bookstore, then Borders, sometimes Barnes and Noble, and I would go into the self-help section and I would take my finger along the bindings of those books and imagine where my name, where my book was going to be. And sometimes I would sit down in the aisle, fold over and cry. I would hold my knees and I would start sobbing because I was so afraid that I would never have a book on those aisles. So afraid I would fail. I would be rejected. Sometimes I have fear that I won't be as good as I think I can be, right? That I'm about to do a big presentation like I did a presentation recently for the executives at Victoria's Secret Beauty, and I had fear, knots in my stomach. I'm not going to be as good as they're paying me to be. Or next month, I'm the keynote speaker for Capital One's second annual women's event, and I'm afraid I'm not going to live up to my reputation of what they hired me for. Sometimes I have a fear I'm not going to be as good at this podcast or whatever it might be. And that just makes me feel like a fraud. So those are just some of my fears, and maybe you have some of those same ones. And I actually want you to take a moment 
And I want to ask you, if you are somewhere where you can write these down, great. If not, then just say them to yourself. What are the fears that you have? What are the things that you tell yourself? What does what I call your fear brain say to you? Does it say, I'm not good enough? Does it say, who am I to think about opening up my own Etsy store? Does it say it has to be perfect in order to get it done? Does it say it's not good enough yet? Does it say you need another degree before you can do that? Does it say no one's going to take you seriously? Does it say that's irresponsible? What does fear tell you? What are you really afraid of? There are so many fears working with women every single day. Fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of being found out. And I have had them all, right? Shall I go on about my fears? God, no, right? Because if I go on about my fears, uh, you're going to be sitting here listening to this podcast for another three hours. And I do not want that for you (laughs) as much as I hope you love this podcast. If I allow it, fear could run my life. If you allow it, fear will run your life. And there's a reason for that. We develop fear for very good reason. In psychology, we have something called negativity bias. And if you think about it, the majority of people, their brains go negative more than they go positive, right? You spend more time thinking about what went wrong, what you should have said differently, what might happen, what worries might occur, right? We spend more time on those scenarios and the negativity And that's because our ancestors, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, the way that their brain developed, they had to be able to see threat in order to respond. It's a survival mechanism, right? So I think I've told you about the research study where research participants came into a room and there were the words threat up and opportunity up on the wall in equal measure. And then afterwards they were asked which one, which word was there more of? And people said the word threat when in fact there were equal numbers of the word threat as there were opportunity up on the wall. Our brain is wired to be afraid. And the reason is our ancestors, early ancestors had to be afraid, right? They had to be afraid. Is there going to be a dinosaur that comes by or a saber-toothed tiger that wants to take out my family? They had to be afraid. Are those berries poisonous and we can't eat them? They had to be afraid. And so we are very wired with this negativity bias to go into fear mode very quickly. And in a little bit, I'm going to just describe how your brain works with this because your fear is more prominent. Your fear is actually closer in your brain to your nervous system. So your fear takes over and your body is actually working the way it's supposed to. When your fear takes over, the body is working the way it's supposed to. So if you allow it, fear will run your life and it thinks it's doing a good job. This is the part that is crazy. When your fear starts to run your life, it's like, I'm so awesome. I am taking care of her. Right. So whatever, you know, if we want to, you want to think about your fear as like a being sitting on your shoulder, it thinks that it's being your best friend because it is stopping you from failing. It is stopping you from being rejected. It is stopping you from putting yourself out there. So it thinks that it's being your best friend. Because of that, all it does is hold you back from going for your dreams. If I let fear run my life, it would hold me back from writing this book because I am afraid I am going to be rejected by publishers and the rejections have started to come in. And so fear might make me want to run back to bed and not keep going, even though I know I have a message that I want to make accessible to women all over the world. If I let fear run my life, it would hold me back from getting the support from coaches and mentors that I admire because I would be too afraid to call them. I would be too afraid to spend money on myself. I'd be too afraid that I wasn't worth it. But paying for my mentors changed my life, right? Like if I was afraid right now, the last few months, I've been working with a sensuality and sexuality mentor. And if I were afraid of spending that money on myself because I think I'm not worth it, or I'm afraid I won't get as much out of it, my life has been completely transformed from working with this woman. It's changed my sex life. It's changed my marriage. It's changed my confidence. And frankly, it's changed my podcast. It's changed the amount of joy I have in my life, the amount of pleasure. It's changed how powerful I feel. But if I had been afraid, it would have stopped me from that. If I let fear run my life, it would stop me from approaching new friends. Right? So recently I bumped into a woman that I had met 
I bumped into her and her husband at the farmer's market. And I had such an enjoyable few moments of talking to her and her husband that I immediately emailed her that night and said, hey, let's the four of us go out, right? Her husband and, and me and Josh. And I was afraid. I was afraid she would reject me. And they already have friends. They've been here for a long time. But if I let fear run the show, I wouldn't have emailed her. And she emailed me right back and was like, oh my God, would love to, right? And now we're going back and forth with dates. If I let fear run my life, then I would never announce a new retreat. Next month, I'm taking women to Greece, which is a dream of mine. I've been wanting to go to Greece for years and years. But if I was afraid, I wouldn't put out a new retreat because I'd be afraid that no one would sign up. And that has happened to me. It has happened to me. Of course, it's happened to everybody where we put out a program or you start a, an opportunity of business or it's happened to everybody where it do, they don't, not all ideas come through. But if I were afraid, I would never put out another retreat. And then you would never get to come with me to Greece or Paris or Miami or wherever our next adventure is going to take us. If I was afraid, it would keep me from trying a new dance class or a new yoga class. I actually quit yoga. I started yoga probably 10 years ago and I would look around and everybody was so flexible. And seriously, my love, if you saw me in yoga class, like I am the least flexible person there. <laughs> I just never developed that ability. I've never been able to do the splits. And it's part of why I did not make the varsity team for cheerleading when I was in high school. And it totally like ruined my psyche and ruined my mind. And I cried and cried for, you know, for several nights because I can't do the splits. I'm just not very flexible. And I kept looking around the yoga class 10 years ago, and I had such a fear of being the worst one there. So I quit. Which looking back, I mean, I can have so much love for my younger self for her fear. But now I'm like, oh my God, I could have 10 years of enjoyment because I love yoga. And I don't go to like crazy sweat my butt off yoga. If you do awesome Anya, for me, I go to the gentle yoga because it's so good for my mind because I have an hour where someone else is like gently holding me and taking care of me and helping me to love my body and stretch my body and empty my mind. And I love it so much. And imagine I could have had 10 years of all that love and enjoyment, not to mention in those 10 years, I probably would have become a lot more flexible. So if I let fear run my life, I would not be talking to you you would not be listening to the Purpose Girl podcast because I never would have started it because I would have been so afraid that nobody would listen. I would have been so afraid that you would rate it terribly or that it just would never take off. So my love, if you let fear run your life, what happens is that you stop living. Let me repeat that. If you let fear run your life, you are no longer living. I would love to tell you that one day you will be fearless. This is what I said to my client when she came to me. I wish I could tell you that one day you're going to be fearless. And look, maybe you will. Maybe you're going to be the one person. I have seen a couple of people say that they no longer have fear. And what I honestly think is going on with those people is that they have accepted fear as part of life. They've come to deep acceptance of every one of their emotions that sometimes they're going to be angry. Sometimes they're going to be sad. Sometimes they're going to experience shame. And at a deep acceptance, a level of just allowing those emotions to come and not letting them stop you. Those people have accepted fear as a part of life. I also have seen people accept that there's nothing to fear because every situation leads to growth, right? I am, I am not there yet. It is something I'm working toward. I'm way more evolved in this way than I used to be. But this is daily practice and so have a long, I have such a long way to go, right? The idea here is that there's no reason to fear fa failure because let's say you had a dream of starting a nonprofit and let's just say that you cannot get it off the ground, that you have not been able to attract any investors. You haven't been able to put a board of directors together and it appears to be a quote unquote failure. So the idea here is that there is no such thing as failure because you learn from the experience, right? So maybe just trying to open up a nonprofit led you to a whole new mission that you can then take out into the world in another way through a podcast, through a blog, through working for a different organization. 
Or maybe the process introduced you to a hot new lover or a best friend along the way because you went to the bank to open up an account and you started talking to the banker and you started sharing your passion for endangered animals, endangered species in sub-Saharan Africa. And you were like in awe that the other person, right, the banker had the same passion as you. And you started talking and that person is now your best friend or your new lover. So then there's no fear. There's no failure here because you got something out of the experience, right? So that's another way to look at there's nothing to fear because every experience is going to be exactly what you need in your life. For those people, right, who say that they have no fear. And listen, I so aspire to that. And one of the things I've really been working with lately is saying everything happens for me, right? So nothing happens to me. Everything is happening for me. And the same is true for you. And that is hard. Okay. I'm not saying it's easy to look at every situation, cancer, God forbid, miscarriage, a death in a family and say, oh, that's happening for me. And you might be rolling your eyes and think that sounds like a bunch of, you know, woo woo. I get it. And if we have that approach that everything happens for us, then we no longer have to fear the outcome, not turning out exactly the way that we want it. So it's another way to look at that because if we can look at something, if we can look at a situation and not be attached to the outcome, right? That if I write my book, it has to be published by a big publisher. If I let go of that outcome or that it has to be on the shelves of Barnes and Noble and be sold a million copies, if I let go of that outcome and I go back to my purpose of why am I doing it, why I'm doing it is to give you my message is to, to give you the guidance, give you the courage, give you the tools that you need right at your fingertips that you can go back to over and over and over again, keep it on your nightstand without you needing to listen to every episode or without you needing to do the coaching, right? So it's like, that's why I'm doing the book. I want it accessible to everybody around the world. So if I let go of the outcome around the book, right, that it has to be published by a big publisher or it has to be sold as a New York Times bestseller, it has to sell a million copies. And I just focus on the purpose, the purpose that every woman around the world can now receive this message of happiness and purpose, message of courage, of going for it, and the tools that I teach. And it's accessible and she can go back to it over and over and over again, keep it on her nightstand. That's the purpose of writing the book. Then I don't have to fear writing it as much because I'm not so attached to the outcome, right? So I am aspiring to have that kind of thinking. And in the meantime, we can still learn to work with the fear. So let's say you are so far from that. Let's say you're like, that sounds like a bungus show woo-woo, okay? But you want to know, how do I still take action? How do I still have fear and take action? We can learn to work with it in order to be happier. You can learn to work with it. So the reason that fear makes you so miserable is that you let fear run the show. And left to its own devices, fear will keep you stuck because that is fear's job. See, we all have something, as I mentioned, called the fear brain, and it's your base brain. And so if you think about your brain, you actually could make like a fist right now with your thumb inside of the other fingers. And that is actually like a mini model of your brain. And your thumb, right, the outside of your thumb represents this fear brain or this core brain. And then your fingers over it represent what's called your human brain or your neocortex. And it's a newer brain. So if we look at how the brain evolves, sometimes the fear brain is also called the reptilian brain. And that's because reptiles have it too. And that's the part of your brain that's always kind of in the negative, always in the fear. And it's called reptilian because if you think about what reptiles do, right, they all they have to do is survive. They like slither along. They've got a fear being hunted. They've got to eat, right? So it's like that your brain is is that core brain, that fear brain. That's what it's trying to do. It's just trying to survive. And it sits closest to your brainstem. So if you're making your little brain model with your hand, your brainstem is your wrist and all the way down your arm. The reason that that's so important is that that's where your central nervous system sits. So your fear brain is actually closer. And that's why a small bit of fear can feel like the freaking Titanic. It can feel like huge mountains to overcome because 
it sits so close to your nervous system that it acts before your rational brain can inter- can intervene. And let me give you an example. Okay. So one of my friends, her husband will not fly. He will not fly. She has to go. If she wants to go on vacation with him, it has to be somewhere that they can drive. But if she wants to go recently, she wanted to go overseas and he literally would not go with her. Now he points to a lot of plane crashes as evidence, quote unquote evidence that airplanes are unsafe. However, according to a 2008 study by the National Safety Council, the odds of dying in a motor vehicle accident are one in 98 in a lifetime. While for air transport, the odds are one in 7,178. Okay, so you're much more likely to die in a car than you are in an airplane. But his fear brain has it in his mind. And therefore, anytime he sees a plane crash, which we don't see that often, something kicks in his brain, right? He's got these thick neural pathways. So basically, we all have about 600 billion neurons up in our brain, and those neurons form pathways whenever we think something or we hear something. So it's like, think about the the chair that you're sitting on right now listening to this. Well, when you were a baby, you didn't know that that was a chair. You had to hear the word chair over and over and over again associated with this thing that you're sitting on so that now you don't have to look at it and question it. You just know, oh, that's a chair, and you sit. The same is true with whatever you have come to believe about your fear. So for him, it's that flying is a death trap. For you, it might be that if you put out your art, you'll be rejected. Or it might be that if you really go for your dream of singing, becoming a singer, then you'll be too much. People will think you're bragging. It might be that if you were to admit kind of how sensual you are, how sexual you are, other people will call you a slut because that's what you heard growing up. So you have very strong neural pathways around your own fear. That is your brain trying to do its job. It's a survival mechanism. And it does something called confirmation bias. That's what we call it in psychology, which basically is your brain is on the hunt, on the lookout to try to confirm that it's correct. So it sees more of its fears, right? You ever notice that? You see more of your fears? Your brain is doing its job. However, your brain doing its job of fearing, unfortunately, might be keeping you quote unquote safer, but is it really? If you have a dream of opening an Etsy store, is it really safer to not open it? Because what are the consequences? The consequences, uh, if I had to guess, if you're like me or like my students, like my clients, the consequence then is beating yourself up. The consequence is already feeling like a failure because you haven't done it. The consequence is shame. The consequence is guilt. So fear tells you that you're going to have this big consequence and it quote unquote keeps you safe, but it doesn't really keep you safe. It keeps you small. And being small feels shitty. You were not born to be small. You were not born to be small. No one was born to be small. Why on earth would we have been born if we were not born to be glorious? If we were not born to spread our wings and be as powerful, as expressive, as shiny as we could possibly be? Why would you have been given talents? Why would you have been given art talent if you were never meant to share it with the world? Why would you have been given writing talent if you were never meant to inspire other people with it? Why would you have been given singing talent if nobody was ever meant to hear your voice? You wouldn't have been given that talent. And listen, I get it. When I first thought of doing this career, I was terrified. I thought, who do I think I am? No one's going to want to listen to me. I was so scared to admit it to anybody because I thought I sounded ridiculous. I thought I sounded lofty. I thought I sounded braggy and I thought I sounded kind of woo woo. And I remember becoming friends with uh, my dear friend, Allison. It was 2001 and she and I were taking a walk on a very like cool winter morning. We were living outside of Detroit in Michigan. And I remember being like, so afraid to share with her my dreams, but we were talking about dreams. And so I remember kind of sheepishly admitting to her that I thought I was maybe kind of, I don't know, supposed to have maybe my own, like, I don't know, TV show one day. And I felt like I kind of had to apologize for it. So I quickly said, but I I know it's probably never going to happen. Right. And then I remember looking down at my feet with tears in my eyes. I couldn't even look at her. I had so much shame of admitting this. And immediately Allison stops walking. 
She stomps her foot on the ground and then joyfully screams out loud, of course you are. And she gave me the biggest hug. I couldn't believe it. She saw me. She believed in me. And she's still my best friend today because of that. And if you ask her about my work, she will still get a tear in her eye because she always knew that my desires were truth. Now, some people think of fear as false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real, right? So I had, I thought I had evidence that I was lofty for thinking about this dream. So I thought it was real, but that wasn't real. The loftiness wasn't real. The desire, the knowing that I was meant, I was put on this earth in order to inspire women, that was real, that was truth. What was going on there is I was afraid if I actually shared my dream, they never came true. I would look stupid. I would look like a fool, right? And I was so afraid of that. So afraid of that. And all of this gets down to mindset. Carol Dweck at Stanford has done incredible research on mindset. And she talks about how even as children, we have one of two mindsets. One is called a fixed mindset and one is called a growth mindset. And a fixed mindset says, either I am smart or I am not. You're either intelligent or you're not. And a growth mindset is I can learn to be more intelligent. I can learn to be smarter, right? Fixed mindset says I'm an athlete or I'm not. Growth mindset says with more practice, I can become more athletic. Now people with a growth mindset, they actually become more successful because they're willing to quote unquote fail because they don't see it as a failure. They see it as an opportunity to learn and grow. But kids and then adults who have a fixed mindset become so paralyzed by fear that they actually take the small route. They take the easy way out and then they're never as happy. So our opportunity is to really feel into what is it that you are afraid of? What is it that you desire that you deeply, deeply, deeply desire? And how is fear right now trying to hold you back? Now, here's the thing. I just concluded leading Goddess Girls Retreat. We had 29 women in Miami and we got so deep into our desires. And I asked the women, what is holding you back, right? What, what is your brain telling you? What's holding you back? And as the women were talking about it, they knew that the things that their brain said were illogical, right? It doesn't make any sense. I shouldn't let this hold me back. I shouldn't let stupid to think that I can't make it or that other people will think this about me. It's like, so your brain knows, right? Your higher brain knows that it's quote unquote illogical. But a big thing then that we talked about in the retreat is the part of you that created that fear is actually your younger self. So what happens is that when you were a little girl, or if you're a man listening to this or a boy, you are a little boy, you were your true self, right? You were naturally dancing and dancing and dancing in the living room. And you were just such a dancer and such a show person. Like I was on a group call recently and someone's four-year-old daughter came on and she wanted the attention. Yes, I wanted to give it to her, right? Because she was in her glory and her true self. But along the way, right, one of my clients, she was a big, she, very colorful and a dancer and she loved to do cartwheels and show off and entertain and she wanted to be entertaining. And her family was a first generation American family and they just wanted her to study. No more dancing, no more cartwheels, just study, study, study. They wanted her to do something that was involved in medicine, study. And so she learned that that part of her that was colorful, was wrong, was bad, unlovable. And that's why we get fear about our truth, about our deepest desires, because we learn that our deepest desires, that the truth of our heart, that really what makes our heart sing is not lovable, not acceptable. And at our core, every single one of us, what we most want is to be loved. Every human alive, under everything, even under someone's hate and anger, is because they feel so unloved and unlovable and they have so much hate and anger because they feel like that's the only way to get loved. So your fear kicks in, right? Your brain, your fear brain kicks in and says, I'll help you. So let's take my client who the sing, loved to dance and cartwheels. Her fear brain kicked in maybe when she was like seven years old, eight years old, or 10 years old and said, I will help you be lovable in your family by making sure that anytime you think about dancing or you think about cartwheels, I will tell you that to stop. I will tell you that that's not good. I will tell you that that's a bad thing. And then we develop these strong neural pathways, right? The brain starts to learn dancing is bad. 
art is bad. One of my clients became, is, is a painter. It's, she realized it was her dream, but when she was younger, she watched TV and there were commercials for something of starving artists. So her brain developed these thick neural pathways that said, oh, if I become an artist, I will starve. Well, who the heck wants to starve? So fear brain told her she was going to starve. And so fear brain is just doing its job. So you might know it's illogical, but fear brain kicks in. And while I'd love to tell you that you will never fear again, right? Instead, it's what do you do with your fear? Well, Liz Gilbert, who is one of my favorite authors, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she says in her more recent book, Big Magic, she realizes that fear is never going to go away. Rather, she says to it, all right, I know you're coming along for the ride but you are not in the driver's seat, right? Like get in the back seat. I'm in the driver's seat, right? So it's the key here is that fear does not run the show anymore. Fear does not get to drive. How do we do that? We actually learn to become friends with our fear because again, fear is just trying to keep you safe. So when you feel fear, purpose power tip number one, you want to identify what am I really afraid of? What's really going on here? You think I'm afraid to launch the the Etsy shop. No, what am I really afraid of? I'm afraid it's going to fail. I'm afraid I'm going to look stupid. What are you really afraid of? Become friends with your fear. Gently, lovingly, hand on your heart. Remember your fear is just coming from your five-year-old self or your seven-year-old self or your 15-year-old self. So imagine that younger self, lean into it with love and say, Hey, fear, what do you want me to know? And if you do that and you're quiet, fear will tell you. It will say, I'm just scared. No one's going to like you anymore if you become big and famous. It will say, I'm afraid that if you fail, people will find out you're not smart. When you hear fear from that younger voice, you can then wrap your arms around it, wrap your arms around yourself and say, I hear you. And even if that happens, we're going to be okay. Okay. So that's purpose power tip number one. Purpose power tip number two, that's more on the emotional side, right? So you emotionally kind of work with your fear and you give it tons of love. Purpose power tip number two, you work with fear in your mind. One of my favorite exercises in positive psychology is what we call worst case, best case, most likely. So what fear does is it gives you the worst case. Fear loves saying, but what if, but what if, but what if, right? So let's just take the example of a client of mine who wanted to become a model. But what if I fail? What if no one hires me? What if, all right, worst case, what if you fail? Well, if I fail, then no one will hire me. Okay. If no one hires you, what's the worst case? If no one hires me, then I'm not making any money. Okay. You're not making any money. Then what's the worst case? And until her brain gets to the point where she's living under a bridge because she has no money, right? Now, of course, and, and it's almost comical. I mean, not really, but she looks at, she, I'm she's never going to let herself get under a bridge right? She's going to go do whatever she has to do for work before that. That's why you see a lot of people who pursue the arts. They wait tables. They are personal assistants. They do other things to bring the money in while they're pursuing a career that has a different kind of pay system to it, right? The thing is that our brain usually does worst case scenario and then leaves it at that. And so we are in a stuck, we stay in a state of fear. What if we just, I don't know, counteracted And we said, but what if the best case happens, right? How often does your brain do that? So if you're going to go with worst case, then you've got to be fair, right? This is positive psychology. We've got to be fair and at least balance it out. Let's go with best case. So take my client who wants to be a model. Best case. Best case, I get hired by a small retailer. Awesome. And then what's the best case? Well, the best case is that then a big brand sees my work and they want to work with me. Awesome. So What's now the best case? Well, best case, then Gucci calls me and they fly me to Russia. Awesome. Now what's the best case? Oh, well, now the best case is I'm on the catwalk and I'm, I'm making this up as I go along. But And then the best case is I end up on Oprah, right? So it's like, okay. So on the one hand, we're under a bridge. And on the other hand, we're on Oprah making $17 million. Now, are either one going to happen tomorrow? No. So by her going for a modeling audition, what is the most likely thing that will happen. That's her next job, right? So we can kind of look at it. What's the percent chance that she'll end up in a box under a bridge? And she's like, uh, kind of like 1% because I would probably go work 
you know, as a waitress or something before that, what's the percent chance that you'll end up $17 million in Oprah? She's like, actually a better chance, maybe 10%, you know, so like a better chance of the best case. Now let's find the in the middle. What's the most likely? Most likely scenario is that I go and I audition and maybe I don't get the first one. And then I audition for three more and eventually I get my first job. And then I do the first job and most likely I learn from it and I improve my pictures. I improve my work and then I get the next job, right? So worst case, best case, then we come to most likely and you find that most likely is usually not that scary. I love this tool. So that's your second purpose power tip. Third purpose power tip is so simple. It's like my favorite, favorite, favorite. I call this tool diffuse. It's ask a simple question. That simple question is, is it true? And even better, what else is true? Is it true that you're going to fail? We don't know. What else is true? Well, I might succeed. What else is true? And then you can say, well, what else is true about why you might succeed? Well, I have talent. I've got friends. I've got resources, et cetera, et cetera. What else is true? The key here is that we become friends with our fear. Listen, fear usually arises because we're on the verge of something good, right? It's only scary because it's going to stretch you. So if you feel fear about something, it's usually a pretty good sign that you're on the right track, right? Like you don't have any fear about going home tonight and sitting on the couch and watching Netflix for a couple hours, as opposed to you might have fear about actually sitting down and writing a business plan for your Etsy store. You only have fear when you're on the right track. Fear tells you, hey, this is something good. And research on the brain, um, research by Kelly McGonigal, she says that fear, stress, anxiety, and excitement, right? So if you look, fear and excitement actually look very similar in your body. It's really just a matter of how you think about it, how you think about it. So if you're on the verge of something, right, that is usually a really good sign. So I am on the verge of creating a worldwide movement for women's happiness. One day, Women's Global Happiness Day, one day dedicated to women being happy around the world. I've got such big plans and I am so scared to launch it because I'm afraid that it will fail. And that means I'm on the right track. I have another idea for a big event that I want to bring to different cities where I line up powerful women's motivational speakers and you get a whole day event. And I'm talking to the to someone about the first one. And it's like really scary. So that tells me I'm on the verge of something that is totally on track. So the key here is let yourself feel that fear. Know that it's normal. It's okay. And then turn that fear into fuel. You want that fear, right? You want to love it, use your mindset. And then finally, last purpose power tip, turn it into fuel. Like, I'm going to show those publishers whether they want me or not. I'm getting that book done. That's kind of a place where I'm at right now. Turn that fear into fuel so that you become the woman on purpose that you were born to be. And then you create new neural pathways that are the truth in your brain. I can publish a book. I can have an Etsy store. I will do this. I am capable. You take whatever your fear is and you flip it into the positive and then you say it over and over and over and over again. As Amy Cuddy says in her TED Talk, you fake it until you become it. Because the more you fake it, the more you act it, the more you say it to yourself, the more your brain knows it. I want to leave you with my favorite quote, perhaps one of my favorite quotes, if not my favorite quote of all time by Marianne Williamson. She says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And so my love, your playing small is not serving the world. And this is a big fear. They talk about fear of success. Fear of success is fear that if I 
I'm too big, then people won't love me. Maybe you've been told that because of your sister or brother. They didn't want you to outshine them. That happened to one of my clients. Her father was a minister. And so he told her, don't be the smartest one in class. Don't get all A's. You don't want to brag. And so we play small. Well, my love, my purpose girl, no more playing small. You were born to shine as children do. That's your natural state. So with that, I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Purpose Girl Podcast. If you did, please, please, please share it with your friends, share it with your sisters, share it with your mother, share it with your guy friends, share it with everybody. We want to build a community of purpose girls who are women on purpose, who are out there and we are declaring that we are worthy of our dreams and we are going to make them happen. That's how we're going to change this world. So share this. Also, please, please, please rate it. Give it five stars. Review it. If you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe. What are you waiting for? And if you want more, I have a Facebook group for us Purpose Girls. It's called Purpose Girls. One word. Look for it. It's a free Facebook group. Every week you're getting motivation from me in a simple way. You can start interacting with the other women and together we are going to shine. We're going to be as big as we were meant to be and inspire each other because that's how this change is going to happen in the world. And of course, go on my website, sign up for my newsletter. You get a free living on purpose guide when you do. It's right on my website, purposegirl.com. You can find me on Instagram at Karen Rockhind, on Facebook, Coach Karen Rockhind. And I love hearing from you. Let me know what you've been afraid of, how you're going to love your fear, how you're going to talk to it, and what action you're going to take forward. Send me an email, post on my social media. I love, love, love hearing from you. As usual, thank you for listening. May you live purposefully. May you love, 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 love yourself. And may you love life. Bye for now.